Hey guys, it is Tim, and you're watching Tabletop Terrors, where we believe that anyone can be more creative, and we prove it using tabletop games. Um, this is Daily Damage. This is a live stream from my car, where we do tips, tricks, world building, and today we have a very, very, very special episode. Um, there is a little thing that I like to call Geek and Sundry, you, you may have heard of it, and there's this cool dude who writes for it. Uh, named Jim Moreno, and uh, he has this awesome article that caught my attention. I asked him if I could go over it live, and he said, absolutely. Monstrous campaign plot lines. So we're going to give you six campaign plot lines that you can use. I'm going to take his article, and basically, I'll make sure to link it below, but I'm going to take his article, and I'm going to go through it, and we're going to just brainstorm. So we've been doing a lot of world building, and now I want to take that and I want to strike the rock. I want to push and create some conflict using some of the world building we've done and then some of these things right here. But first, a Tabtarian toast. Will you raise your drinks with me? May you mend the first break. May you kill the first snake. And may you conquer everything you undertake. Slancha. All right. This is a live stream on our Facebook channel, which means there are people in this chat and we're going to talk to them right now. Thomas Carpenter is here. Brad Proctor is here. Joey Byer says, hey, Tim, driving, so I won't comment much. Ready for a good episode. Buckle up, literally. Dragon Eggs Benedict is here. Awesome. We got a, a lot of really cool people here right now. So special thanks to Geek and Sundry and Jim Moreno for giving me the permission to go over this stuff. Again, I will link the article. But basically, Jim has written my stream for me, and I am going to go through, uh, and I'm calling these monstrous Moreno campaign ideas. So it's very difficult to come up with campaign plot lines, um, no matter you know, what style of game you're running, I think that that's one of the major things that Dungeon Masters are looking for. That extra special thing, the thing that brings the players from where they are in their comfort zone, following that cycle of the hero outside of what their their norm is into something awesome, epic, and heroic. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So, specifically, the inspiration for these ideas are coming right out of the 5th edition Monster Manual. So, these are going to be six campaign ideas we're going to talk about, and we're going to use quotes and page numbers for reference so you can dig right in. And we're also going to talk about at the end of the stream, if you stick till the end of the stream, I'm going to tell you something that I really messed up in doing as a dungeon master and how I fixed it. Um, so this is Monstrous Moreno, campaign idea number one, search for the seven shards. The monster we're using this is the Aracocra. The Aarakakra, the Arokara, page 12 of the Monster Manual. So essentially, the Wind Dukes of Aqua came from a race of elemental beings called the Vati, which once ruled many worlds. This creature, known as the Queen of Chaos, arose, and she basically instigated interplanar war. So to combat this threat, seven Vati heroes combined their powers and made this rod of law, this super weapon. Now you, you're gonna, this is gonna sound familiar as we get there, but this is a cool reskinning of it. So in this battle against the Queen of Chaos and these elemental beings, this rod was shoved into Miska the Wolf Spider. Basically, by thrusting this rod into the Wolf Spider like a spear, it destroys the greatest general of the Hordes of Chaos. The rod, of course, shattered into how many parts? Seven. So this is the rod of seven parts. This is how you can do a really cool version of this. So that's the old lore. That's the bedrock and the foundation of how you can actually have the back in the day have unfurled. But right now, to start the campaign, you drop hints and clues about the location, obviously, of only one of these parts. If you've watched Winds of Sur Celine, you'll see that this is exactly what Barker did, and he was really smart about the way that he did this. But basically, you can even let the players stumble into this. Like, uh, I mean, this could be like a burn-after-reading scenario where the players just find the piece in some creature's random loot stash. Maybe the creature doesn't even know that this is part of a rod of seven parts. But essentially, it 
is obviously highly sought after. And they, I would think, would be a cool plot is to get in deeper than they imagine right, you know, from the get-go is all of a sudden people realize what this is and are after them. So then you can develop scenarios and, and encounters around this search, basically pulling in the the Vati, the Arakakra, the Miska, uh, you know, all these things we talked about, elementals, chaos, and things like that, all wanting this rod. And you can have them eventually travel across the multiverse for this campaign. So that's the first monstrous Moreno campaign idea, number one, using the Arakakra and the uh, Rod of Seven Parts, which I thought was a really cool one. We're going to definitely check in between, uh, in between monstrous campaign ideas. We'll check the chat. So, Philip Mati says, hi. Caleb Christian Cheryl says, I've missed several of these. When did the Tabtarian Toast start? Uh, probably it was the beginning of the new year. The beginning of the new year is the first time it really kind of hit me. And then James and I just adopted it. Like, we're going to do it. Dave Hubble is here. Ken Knapper. Sean DeJazo. Rory McDonough says, hey, guys. Give me some cool concepts. Here they come. Joshua Law is here. Brandon McMillan says, ah, yes. This will be perfect. Rings hands. Alan Holloway is here. Dragon X Benedict says, that sounds like a fun reskinning. Yeah, I really love it. Uh, Jim is... He's a plot crafting wizard. I really like the depth that he's brought to these, which brings me to number two. This is the monstrous Moreno campaign idea number two, Roots of the Golthias Tree. Now this uses blights. So if you're in your monster manual, blights are on page 31. Here's the thing. Blights can too quickly and easily be the thing you throw into a forested region. Hey, what are the players gonna fight? I don't know, let's do a random encounter against some blights. You know, and it's like, you can totally go away from that. Make blights important. Make them have a culture and a society that actually messes with the ecology of the world. Um, so in this particular campaign idea, he talks about this legend of this vampire. And the vampire's name is Gulthias. And they basically, this vampire used abominable magic to raise this horrific tower. He called it the Nightmare Spire. Um... But, of course, like all vampires, a hero eventually got strong enough and plunged a stake through his heart. So the vampire was destroyed. But the problem is that his blood was infused uh, into the stake. So it gave the stake this dreadful power. I love this already because the stake used was this weapon to slay the villain. Now has some of the villain's essence in it. And that's a really cool concept already. But basically, in time, these tendrils of new growth start sprouting out of this wood. They start sprouting out of this stake. And it grows into a sapling that's infused with this vampire's evil essence. Are you super intrigued yet? I think this is so good. Basically, it's said that a mad druid discovers the sapling and transplanted it into an underground grotto. Because we all know that mad druids love to rent those underground grottos. And they get a really good deal in the Forgotten Realms because they know all the good realtors. But that's not the point. The point is... Now, from this tree, this vampiric tree, that's where the blights are coming from. That's so baller. That's, mm. Now, here's the thing. Since blights in D&D, since blights in D&D are awakened plants that are gifted with mobility, intelligence, you know, um, this is a really good way to make them kind of terrifying. And so you can even make it a, a random quest early on in their career where the players hear of this vampire legend and they won't put two and two together. But it, again, it gives that really good seed. No pun intended. Um, and so to me, the other thing is, is and I love this. He talks about this uh, journal of the mad Druid who basically they could totally stumble upon. This could be kind of like the session three, like here's the call to action situation where he's babbling about finding this wooden stake and how he searched for his whole life. And as your players begin to find more and more clues and encounter these blights and so on, they begin to realize, okay, there's more of these than we first thought. And then basically they can, I think the campaign should culminate at the tree. You got to destroy the tree, right? So anyway, super awesome, really cool way to pull druids in. Let's do this right now. Wasn't in the article. We're going to make this up off the cuff. Blood Druids. What's a Blood Druid? Comment below. Tell me what you think a Blood Druid is because I think it needs to be a class in our campaign world of Dragon Grin. Full show. Let's see here. Hassan is here. What's up? He says, hello. I made it in time. Chris Wilhelm says, the next one is the best. Just saying. Oh, <laughs> Sean. Nice pronunciation. Thanks, man. 
Now I need to memorize your last name. It's Carney, like car and knee. Joshua Law says, ah, the blight of the blight. Jason Smith is here. Nicholas Hartunian. Hey, man, Nicholas, my man, my man, Nicholas. One of my favorite world builders. Every time I post something, Nicholas always comes up with or has something in his homebrew world that I'm like, yes. And I love it because it always has a specific tone that all fits together. Lore can be easy to make, but making a world seem like it works and that the lore all works together is very difficult. Nicholas kills that. All right, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to do the ah Monstrous Moreno campaign idea number three, unfinished business. Now, the monster in this one is a ghost, page 147 of your monster manual. And I love that these aren't just based off of, you know, deep on the bench. You know what I'm saying? This isn't like, all right, we're three goals ahead, you know, send in the rookie you know, defenseman to do a slap shot from the point. It's like, no, these are tried and true monsters that I think are underused or used in small spurts for encounters, but not necessarily campaign plots. So this is cool. Um, ghosts, what are ghosts? Well, they always want to finish something, right? They always have these uncompleted tasks from another life. So ghosts are often looking to avenge their own death or fulfill an oath, relay a message, something that's unfinished. And one of the things that's cool is that a ghost... I think that's cool is that a ghost doesn't necessarily realize that it's died. So it continues its everyday, everyday routines, which that's a way to, to have the players be able to interact with this ghost as if it's just like scaring people as it goes off to work, just trying to figure out why it can't cobble shoes anymore. Um, but the surest way to rid an area of a ghost, as it says in the monster manual, is to resolve it if it's unfinished business, whatever that may be. Let's destroy the idea of a single ghost. That's a cool idea, and there's all kinds of cool stuff you can do with that. But no, that's not what this is about. This is a monstrous Moreno campaign idea. Moreno campaign idea number three. Got to get his last name right. I hope I am. Jim, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Um, but what about a town or an entire city of ghosts? What about ghosts that are actively trying to complete some unfinished business so that they have these just multiple ghosts that have all these different quests that they need finishing. So the players essentially stumble into this town and this is kind of where the campaign takes place is your players are, and you can even go with a, you know, like a, an Aragorn situation, you know, where they have a certain tie or power over these ghosts to a small degree so that the ghosts will say, okay, well, why don't you do this and I'll do that kind of helping each other. But to me, Having that hotbed of quests leading up to, to me, I think a cool thing, and this is what he mentioned in the article, is finding out what caused them to be ghosts in the first place. Now, you can come up with any calamity, anything that would work, but to me, I think it should be something, um, unfortunately, it should be something tragic, because I think that the ghosts being formed out of the sudden eradication of a whole city, I mean, that's a big deal. Even if it's a village, but I think that's really cool. So that's campaign idea number three is using ghosts and having a whole village of unfinished business. Let's check the chat here. Josh Glisson is here. Dragon Eggs Benedict says, oh, Timothy Waters says, made it again. Let's hear these plots. Matthew Jones has joined us. Dragon Eggs Benedict says, blood druid. Druids that have embraced the predatory side of nature and take on a survival of the fittest philosophy. They use the life force other of others to improve themselves seeking to become the top of the world's food chain. Listen to this. That is amazing. And let me tell you what the name of a blood druid power and ability is. Apex Predator. That would be cool. Josh Glisson is here. Sean DeJazo. Blood druid. Spells and abilities are powered from the death or blood of nature or animals or themselves. Not necessarily involuntarily given, but sacrificed or given to complete the cycle of nature. That's awesome. Nicholas said, hey, thanks for the shout out, man, for sure. Thanks for all the wicked cool lore all the time. Sam Nelson said, a town full of quest givers. That's exactly right. In, in Monstrous Campaign Idea Number 3, this is a town of in World of Warcraft with the, uh, the exclamation point. No, it's the question mark. No, the exclamation point. What was the start of the quest and what was the end? I haven't played WoW in a while, but it's that. You just walk in there and it's all the yellow end of statement, uh, end of sentence punctuations. Joshua Law, Atlantis of Ghosts. Oh, dude, that would be awesome. Ah, that's perfect. 
Like, a sunken city? Oh, and all of them are wandering onto the shore trying to go home? Oh, that's amazing. Chris Willem said, The Circle of Blood is outlawed in Dragon Grin. The group gathers to trade healing secrets and techniques. The Circle specializes in blood magic. Some say that the Circle has been outlawed because there may be a connection between their magic and the dismembered lord himself. They grow plant material in their own blood and body to aid in their druidic magic. Those that follow the path of evil grow plants in the body of the enemy. Ah, oh, this is so sick! Nicholas Hartunian says, I like my ghosts to have a palpable melancholy about them. Yeah, to me, that's the difference between a ghost and a wraith or some of those other malevolent spirits. To me, the ghost is more the... I think melancholy is the perfect word. That's great. So... Monstrous, Moreno, Campaign Idea, Number 4, Abyssal Origins. This is Ghouls. So we went from Ghosts, now we're going to go to Ghouls, some more tangible undead. Um, ghouls trace their origins to the Abyss. Okay? So, Dorsain, the first of their kind, uh, was an elf worshipper of Orcus. So, he turned against his own people, and he feasted on humanoid flesh to honor Orcus. Okay? Now... As a reward for this service, Orcus tra he transformed him into the first ghoul. Yeah, awesome reward. Thanks. Um, but that's what Dorsain wanted. And so he served Orcus faithfully in the abyss. And he, he kept creating more and more ghouls. Um, and then essentially he, I would say, continued to do this until there was an incursion by Yangu, uh, the demonic no lord. And basically... Uh, Yangu robbed Dorsain of the Abyssal Domain. They took over and wrecked shop, or at least had a bunch of conflict going on. So that's your bedrock. That's your deep foundation. But the idea here is that when Orcus wouldn't intervene and stop Yangu from doing that, Dorsain basically tried to do what everyone else would do and go, okay, I'm sorry. Can some of you good elf gods help me? Uh, and they took pity on him. Believe it or not, they actually did take pity on him, and they helped him escape that doom. Since then, since that connection, elves have been immune to the ghoul's paralytic touch. But since Dorsain was the first ghoul, um, you can make that tale one of... Like, put it this way, and we did a video on this. Make that all happening right now. You don't have to make that tales of 100 years ago. You have that going on right now. There was a time in your world when ghouls didn't exist. Go to that time. Go right now. Ghouls don't exist and all of this is happening. Watch this unfold. Go to the cool part. And it doesn't have to have happened 100 years ago. It happened now. Um, start off with some undead encounters. The ghouls are just starting to kind of come into prominence. Uh, Dorsain in the last year has gained this sort of favor with Orcus and he's rising in power. And then slowly over time, start bringing in more gnolls, more elves, and really delve into the deeper mystery of what's causing all this stuff. And then the campaign can actually end with the redemption. And that's maybe what the players have to do is, uh, on the behalf of whomever they choose to work for, either destroy and defeat Dorsain, which probably wouldn't be the case with most good campaigns, or they have to do a bunch of errands on the behalf of the elven gods to win their favor back so that they then step in and intervene. But make it so that the ghouls would overtake, or Yangu would overtake, and their pride, the elven god's pride, pride of the entire, I think, pantheon, would keep them from intervening until eventually it has to sound like it was their idea kind of thing. But anyway, you basically guide your party in what they think might be side quests, but they're actually the main quests, and it eventually leads to Dorsain's destruction or his redemption. Uh, so Jim is killing it. And again, check out the article. I'll link it below. These are all from a Geek and Sundry article by Jim Moreno uh, called Monstrous Campaign Plotline. So you can get all this stuff laid out. Uh, it will, it'll essentially be um, a transcript of this, more or less, this stream. Uh, let's check the chat. Timothy Water says, with ghosts, I like to bring them back if the players kill the ghosts without helping them pass the other side. Oh, that's good. I like that. Nicholas says, also loving this blood druid idea. Often this dark, sanguine spellcaster is lumped in with wizards, sorcerers, warlocks. Druids need some creepy loving. Nicholas, that's exactly why I was drawn to it. Because we, exactly what you said. We always get the blood caster, blood sorcerer. And I get it. I understand the 
connection, the immediate thing. But in Dragon Grin, and one of the things we try to do here at Tabletop Terrors is be more creative. And we try to, you know, push past some of this first level creativity. So to me, that's it. Blood Druids are a thing in Dragon Grin. Uh, and the inspiration in this chat has been unreal. So you guys are amazing and brilliant. Uh, we're almost to the end here. And don't forget, at the end of the video, I'm going to talk to you about something I really messed up as a dungeon master and then how I fixed it. Uh, so you'll, you'll probably want to hear that. Uh, this is very recently. Um, so anyway, Monstrous Moreno campaign idea number five. This is called Original Name. This one's super cool. Andrew Knapp would like this one of the channel SR2 Joker. Uh, and all you tabletop RPG uh, one-shot groupers, because this deals with the gith. The monster, the monster we're talking about is on page 158. <clears throat> and here's a quote. Whether these tall, gaunt creatures were peaceful or savage, cultured or primitive, before the Mind Flayers enslaved and chained them, none can say. Not even the original name of their race remains from that distant time. And that's the point of this entire campaign idea, and I'm super digging it, which is, or does it exist? Is it around? And that's, for this campaign, you're basically, the players come into possession of a single page torn out of a book, which, come on, that's cool. Already, campaign starter, either a book or a page out of a book, or a book with pages missing, uh, you know, mix and match, buy one, get one free. Basically, with a single word written on it. And it's got to look awesome, and it's got to look like burnt with gold leaf or something really cool or, or something that fits your campaign or your gif but basically it's the long lost secret name of the gif that's what's on there and it has power you know so by investigating this and you kind of start poking around like hey what's this uh and make the page have cool area abilities like within a mile or something crazy something cool that they people don't even know the players don't realize they're carrying around this object that is changing their reality around them. And then finally, once they kind of catch on, it's like, hey, and then others catch on. And then all of a sudden it's like, you know, it's a mad, 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 mad world. And everybody wants this book. And every plane, I think, needs to get involved. In fact, I'd probably break the campaign up into phases where it the pot begins to boil more and more as different planar creatures and different planes get more and more interested in this power. Because you can't just find a source of primeval power so pure and raw anywhere. So this is like, in our natural world, this is like finding an enormous, huge, uncut diamond. Everyone would be like, uh, yeah, I would like to have that, please. So now, of course, the players would eventually figure out what they have and decide what they do with it. The quest could be as, you know, something as simple as them getting the page to somewhere safe. But of course, if you want to go uh, hard in the paint, the idea is that you want to get them in the middle of a war between the Gith Yankee and the Gith Zari about this page. Um, and then, of course, think about the Illithids, who would love to have that name as well, uh, in order to bring the Gith under control once again. So, again, Jim is killing it with these ideas, and I want to know how you'd run that. Do you even allow Gith in your world? So, Brad Proctor says, Blood Druids, instead of killing their foes, they instead implant them with a seedling, which eventually grows to take over the being's mind and can be controlled like a hive mind by the Druid. Oh, that's so creepy. I love that. Essentially, they can create an army of plant people. And you can even go back to your blights on that one. You know, perhaps these sort of root folk are a half blight, you know? Oh, man, that's that's awesome. And if you want to go really gore on it, like if you want to go kind of horror-esque, the blights grow within people and then do an alien chest burster. Uh, this is the final one. And then I'm going to tell you about my, my mess up as a DM. But the final one is Monstrous Moreno campaign idea number six, King Obald Many Arrows. Uh, King Obald of Many Arrows is a famous, famous orc war chief in the Forgotten Realms. Probably the most famous orc war chief in the D&D game, depending on who you ask. Um, and he has a super violent temper. Like, this... And, and you can think, probably a lot of the iconic, powerful orcs in World of Warcraft, if that's your frame of reference, you just plug that right in. Very similar situation. Um, but he basically used his combat prowess and violence and his temper to get thousands of orcs to follow him under his own... Uh, banner having his own tribe. The idea here is that suddenly he made peace with all of his enemies. What? 
Hold on, no. Let's say that again. Yes, suddenly he made peace with all of his enemies, and it baffled everybody and probably ticked a bunch of the orcs off that were serving under him. I know it would mess me up if the religious zealot or the war chief that I said, yeah, all right, I'll swear my allegiance to you, was like, ha, psych, I would be upset. Um, but the idea is that this peace treaty is in danger of coming undone because it's not really sound. It's not solid. And the idea is that lives of thousands of civilized and peaceful beings are in the balance because if this treaty breaks, then all those orcs are going to go hog wild again. Um, but you need to think about what brought this treaty and put it in place in the first place. So do your players work with King Obald and his army? Or do they investigate the reason for the peace treaty uh, to try to figure out how to make it stand or other things that could help solidify it? You know, do they need people to marry into other countries? Think Game of Thrones when you're thinking this. All these enormous, slow-moving chess pieces, you know, to keep things going. And that's kind of cool. Like, a political intrigue blended with orc warfare on the horizon. That's a flavor I can bite into. Um, so, that's it, man. That's six of them. And I think that they're juicy. I think they're fantastic. I started reading this article and I, I, I basically messaged Jim and I said, hey man, do you mind if I do a live stream where I basically <laughs> go through your article? He said, yeah, man, permission granted. Just tag me and Geek and Sundry. So special thanks to Geek and Sundry as well. And again, I'll link you in this chat and then also on YouTube when this is up there. Uh, now I'm gonna finish reading the chat. We're gonna talk about a couple cool things, but the, the thing I'm gonna tell you is that something that I messed up as a DM and that I ended up fixing that I really had a struggle with, but it's helped me a lot. Um, Brad Proctor. No, I read that one. Matthew Jones says, love the blood druid. Any stats for that? Nah, man, we're just making it up. We're just making it up as we go right now. Um, but you can you can bet that it's gonna be a class archetype in Dragon Grin. That's our campaign, our campaign world available on absolutetabletop.com. Ooh, Nicholas says, chest bursters are cool, but I suggest zombie mind control fungus. Cordyceps is what he linked in there. Joshua Law says, maybe he's under a mind control or was previously. That is actually really good for King Obald. Um, that would make sense. That an Illithid would hop in there, or someone, anything. A, a good wizard would come in there, tweak the dials a little bit, make the peace treaty happen, and then maybe keep him under the spell for as long as possible. But the reason why the, the treaty is uh, failing is because that wizard's power is, is fading and Obald is starting to remember who he is again. And he's starting to have flashes of anger and things like that. So definitely, definitely love that. Uh, so I'm too controlling. That's the thing. That's the thing. As a DM, and this is something I've changed recently. When I say recently, I mean today. Yes and isn't just a fun thing that you read articles about. It has to be a thing that you really do if people are going to devote time to your game. And I mean this. Um, we're running a text RPG game in the tabletop, or the absolute tabletop Discord server. And I'm just starting this today. And my players have had some incredible ideas for characters. Now, when I first imagined the campaign... I imagined them as four human men standing on the wall. Like, that's how I imagined it. So they start telling me these ideas. And I have to admit to you that my first inclination was to go, no, 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 no. And then I really thought, no, I really need to follow this advice. These players are excited about these ideas. They're interested in these ideas. This is what's inspiring them. So this is where yes and really happens. This is where the rubber meets the road. And so I was like, yes. Yes, you can do that. And X. And it wasn't always negative. It was sometimes just facts that needed to follow so that the logic made sense. So the big mistake that I've made, I think, in the past as a dungeon master is being too controlling and not realizing that this is a collaborative storytelling exercise. And when we get together to play, we're all doing this together. I prepare differently than you do as a player. And I might spend a little more to, like, time preparing formally but together we need to build something that we both love. And so that's all. I'm just trying to reinvigorate yes and for you. Um, trying to reinvigorate yes and. Just really consider and go, yes. That makes you happy? Yes. And here's how you temper it. So as basic as that sounds, I had an epiphany with it today. And I'm really happy that I did because the group is not anything like what I thought it was going to be. But guess what? It's going to be a sick, interesting campaign. Um, 
And you know what? I might even post a link to the uh, Absolute Tabletop Discord server if you want to hop in there and read some of the... There's some text roleplay games going on right now. And if you want to be a part of some of them, you can go to the Absolute Tabletop Facebook group and get into some of the interest posts because it's blowing up right now. So anyway, I'm going to hit the chat one more time and then we're going to wrap up the stream. But I want to thank everybody for watching. Don't go yet, though, because it's important that you know that... Tabletop Terrors wants you to really, really know that you guys are the reason why we do this. We absolutely love how brilliant you are, how thoughtful you are, and I I just feel like, and I'm, I'm, of course I'm probably biased, but I feel like more than any channel I see around there, the people who watch Tabletop Terrors is just like this close-knit community, it's like a family. The comments you guys leave, the positivity, it's like, you are Tabtarians, and it's just... It's so rad for James and I. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, let's finish up with the chat. Philip says, Some say he's coming to the spell of a powerful shaman. Many believe he's being extorted by several underlings, seeking gain power. Others posit that this is a savvy political move and he wants chaos to unfold so he can gain further power and reaching influence. What you just saw there was a Tabtarian triangle that is our world building. That is very, very good, Philip. Brad Proctor, what's the name of your game on Discord? It hasn't been started yet, but I think it's going to be called um, something like Broken Are the Marrow or Pieces of Marrow or something like that. Marrow is the name of the shock troops of the Dismembered Lord, and that's going to tie into that. A couple final comments. Timothy Waters says, The orcs in my world have one main king and lots of war chiefs under him. Some defy him until his he shows his scarred face and chipped tooth grin in their encampments. He's fought to keep this reign and has the skulls of those that have failed making his wagon to show his power. That's sick. Um, Jeremy Lilly, what's up, man? We're just wrapping up, but you are awesome. And No Cobalt says, you're welcome. Good morning, Tim. Anyway, thank you all. This has been great. Stay tuned. We're going to keep doing some awesome world building and tips this week. You will see this on YouTube. Be sure to like us on Facebook so you don't miss any of these. And absolutely subscribe if you want to be uncommonly good at D&D, uncommonly good at world building, and part of a community that's awesome. Subscribe now. And until next time, may your dice roll high.